Uh, heavy lifts, the do's and don'ts in heavy lifting. Uh, this is an ideal location to promote uh, some lessons learned from my 45 years of experience in heavy lifting. Uh, but before I start, let me first introduce myself. I was born in 1945, studied mechanical engineering at the Technical University of Delft, mechanical engineering. In 1973, I started working with Big Lift, uh, Big Lift in Dordrecht. Uh, in 1979, Mammut took over Big Lift, and I joined Mammut for a while, and then decided to start a company in engineering of heavy lifts called iTrack. In 1982, I married my wife, Tony. We have uh, two children and three granddaughters. iTrack was started with Joop Rodeburg, which is presently the owner and director of uh, Huisman, Huisman Equipment, famous for its pipe playing equipment and mass cranes and large cranes they are building. In 1987, I left iTrack and became an employer again and joined Van Zeumelen in uh, 87 until 89 when Jumbo, Jumbo Shipping asked me to join them to set up a Jumbo land department which actually was there to uh, uh, execute uh, total transport concepts whereby the client gave the contract to Jumbo and it was from workshop floor until delivered on the job site and everything in between was for Jumbo. So it was not only involved heavy lift shipping but also land transport and installation onto foundation. I did that until early 2001 and then Jumbo asked me to set up a Jumbo offshore department which is now a, a full-grown entity within Jumbo uh, and they do with the use of their heavy lift ships in, in transport, ship and install in one go uh, offshore structures and offshore especially subsea uh, installations. Uh, in 2008, two years before my retirement, I decided to uh, uh, what shall I do after my retirement? And I thought it's a shame that my knowledge and know-how is not transferred to anyone in the industry and to younger people. So in 2008 I came up with the idea to start a heavy transport and lifting seminar. And Michael Kahn, the owner of Jumbo, looked a little bit, he said, but are you going to learn my competitors how to do heavy lifts? So yeah, well, Michael, land transport and lifting with land cranes was why you acquired me to join Jumbo and I also uh, am familiar with shipping so uh, I think there's no harm there's no conflict of interest and he said he, he saw the reason of it so he agreed that I could start with my summer heavy transport and lifting later on he saw the benefit and agreed that I also uh, uh, extended my seminar with uh, shipping heavy lift shipping uh, offshore and I added last year another seminar a chapter called uh, wind turbines onshore and offshore installation techniques. Um, this May, end of May, it was 10 years ago since I started my seminars uh, and that was uh, uh, say a nice target for me to say now it's enough and I uh, was uh, talking to T TWD, Tra Temporary Works Design to join forces, so I've partnered with, uh, with uh, TWD. Uh, they run my website Heavy Lift News and HeavyLiftSpecialist.com uh, and I'm just uh, there to fill in the gaps or do seminars as long as I like it and, and enjoy doing it. That's about me. Um, the content of this presentation, I'll show you quite a bit of videos uh, about incidents. Why do I say incidents? Because uh, incidents are accidents which are preventable. Uh, an accident is actually when lightning strikes. You can't prevent that. The lightning strikes and it's an accident. But incidents, most of the accidents which we call accidents are actually incidents. I'll show you some, force, uh, some, uh, some videos of that. Um, then the basics of handling heavy lifts deals with how to control forces. If you understand the basic laws of Newton, the first, second and third law of Newton, and you understand that well, that's the basis. And when you apply those rules, it will help you in your career preventing incidents. Uh, so we'll talk about forces, masses, center of gravity, stability of equipment, uh, and cargo is crucial. Uh, you don't want 
a trailer loaded with a generator or a stator being tipped over or a ship falling over. Transport stability, three and four point suspension systems for hydraulic platform trailers. Stability criteria of cranes, uh, we are lifting with cranes and still many cranes top tip over because they do not adhere to the basic rules. How we can quickly estimate forces in slings when we are lifting a load, stability of the load to be lifted, that's something which I guess a lot of people have not heard of. What is stability of the load? I'll explain that in detail to you. A stability of ships, the very basics, and some videos and some animations about that. Transport saddles are detaching, also a video, and some video examples of incidents. Um, and then the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of October, uh, we run a, a seminar. Uh, it's either two days or three days. It's up to you what to select. Uh, it, at the TWD office in uh, Marconi Plain in, in Schiedam, a three day seminar. Uh, it's pretty quickly filling up at the moment, but in case you're interested, go to the website, have your specialist, and you will see the details. The airline industry is the safest transport industry in the world if you compare the number of fatalities to the number of people transported. And why is the airline industry so safe? Because if it was not safe, you and I would never fly. It's in the interest of the industry to make it safe. So they have strict procedures and regulations. They train their staff and crew members and they make sure the aircraft is run in a safe way. And if an incident or an accident happens, then they investigate it in great detail and they uh, uh, learn from the lessons of that incident and apply new rules and regulations and change the design or the construction of the aircraft. How can we improve safety in our industry? Well, by sharing experiences and training and education of staff and crew members. Innovation is the key to the game, so do not stand still. Think about how can we improve, how can we innovate and create better ways to do the job. We can all contribute to safety if we want to. But if you don't want, it will not happen. If the managing director, the owner of the company, is not willing to implement a safety program, it's a lost battle. He should set the example. Publish incident reports in order to learn from the, in the mistakes. On Heavy Lift News, we are very eager to receive incident reports so we can share the lessons learned. And finally, remember the seven Ps. Proper planning and preparation prevents poor piss performance. If you do not prepare, if you do not plan, you will have a lousy job and you are bound for incidents. <coughs> Some preventable incidents. Have a look at this load on a hydraulic platform trailer, which was negotiating a camber and the hydraulic platform trailer is made to level the load, but the operator has to know how to do it. If he doesn't do it, that's the result. Here's another example. The hydraulic platform trailer should be raised at this time, but he's just continuing. He's not raising and he's not saying stop, level the trailer, because the center of gravity of that load is shifting towards one axle line, so that axle line's number of axle lines is overloaded, and finally the result is that your load will be rolling over. The trailer now is too late, there's too much pressure in that system and he can't raise the trailer anymore. He, he ignored the basic rules of using hydraulic platform trailers. So it rolls off. Usually you see these things happen in undeveloped countries, but even in developed countries it, it still happens because people's, people do not follow the basic rules, they have not been trained, they have not been instructed. So, something about mass, forces and center of gravity. If we have a block of about one kilo on the table and that block is resting on the table, the earth is pulling at that block with a force equal to 9.81 Newton. And you may say, hey, Newton, why Newton? Well, uh, it's the first, sorry, it's the second law of Newton. He found out there is a relation, a relation between the 
gravity of the earth, if we let this block loose, it will fall down. The earth is pulling at it. Gravity is not the same everywhere. If we have the same block on the moon, the moon is pulling at that block of only one sixth of the force earth is pulling at that mass of one kilogram. So if my weight is for instance 100 kilos, my mass is a weight of 100 kilos, the earth is pulling at my mass with 980 newtons, but on the moon it's only one sixth of that. Mass and weight is different and it's expressed in the formula weight is mass times acceleration. That's what we call the second law of Newton. Now, if there is a second law of Newton, there is also a first law of Newton. And yes, there is also a third law of Newton. I'll explain those in detail. The Earth's gravity is symbolized by the symbol GM, in which G symbolizes gravity. And N is the normal force, so it's a force perpendicular to the plane. On Earth, average G N is 9.81 meter per second square. And it's a bit higher at the poles and a bit lower at the equator. So if you go with your wife to Bali and she steps on the scale in the hotel and says, hey honey, I lost a pound or two. You just say, sorry honey, Earth is pulling with less gravity on your mass. You'll probably be the same mass. So, Force equals mass times meter per second square. It, that's the gravity and, and the, the unit is called Newton. It's kilogram meter per second square. Why do we use that? Because in the field, a captain of a ship or an operator of a crane is lifting and he says, I'm going to lift a load of 100 tons. He is correct by saying that as long as that load is hanging in the crane, it is basically 100 tons, and if you want to convert that into newtons, you just multiply it by 9.81, or if you round it off to 10, it's 1,000, uh, uh, say, uh, 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 1,000 kilonewtons. Yeah? But if you go to the grocery or the market and say, I want 10 newtons of potatoes, the guy says, what is 10 newtons of potatoes? I don't, I don't get it. I have one kilogram of potatoes. Yeah, but that's different. Because if you put one kilogram of potatoes on the scale, and you have the scale still, the pointer measures one kilo. But as soon as the salesman pulls the scale up and accelerates, that acceleration adds up to gravity. And you see the needle going higher. It's the same effect as you have in the elevator. If you're standing in the elevator, the moment the elevator is accelerating your mass, you feel heavier. And if you go down, the accelerator accelerates your body down, so there's an upward force, which means it feels you feel lighter. And that's why forces are so important. If we move an object, yeah, if we move an object, and there's not much room on this on this table. But if I move an object like this, and I have another tower here, and I move it slow, the force by accelerating this mass is so low that it's, it's still stable. But if I move it fast, you see a side force acting on this center of gravity of this load, combined with the downward force of gravity, is pointing over the tipping line. And that's why this tipping line is bigger than this tipping line. That's the tipping line is the circle of this unit. And here is the rectangular of that box. And if I move this, this will fall over. But here the tipping lines are bigger, so it will not fall e so easy over. So lesson number one in heavy transport and lifting is move and start your movements gradually, slowly. So do not go quick, but do it gentle. Start slowly and accelerate slowly in a gentle way. You then slowly build up the speed. And the same as you fly in an aircraft at 900 kilometers an hour, there's no problem because that speed is <coughs> unanimous. And that brings me to the first law of Newton. The first law of Newton says an object 
which flies through space with a unanimous, with a continuous speed, or stays at rest on the table, will fly through space with that same speed, or stay at rest on the table, unless acted upon by an outside extra force. Now we all know if we throw a ball in the, in the air, it will finally fall down because we have outside forces acting on that ball. It's friction of the air. If we pedal our bicycle, we finally slow down because there's friction of the tires on the road, etc. So that's something about forces. And that's why you need to change or convert a mass into Newtons because additional acceleration, F is M times A, acts on that body, in addition to gravity. So, to uh, show you it again, the first law of Newton, any object moving at a constant velocity or at rest, will remain in motion at a constant velocity or at rest until acted upon by an outside force. The second law of Newton is F force equals mass times acceleration. And the third law of Newton is action is reaction. A rocket propels itself in the air and is pushing down at the earth. And it's all symbolized by this simple video. Do I hear something? No sound. Anyway, I'll continue. We'll skip it. Uh, forces. So how do we work with forces and what are forces? Forces are symbolized by an arrow. So if I have a force F1 pulling on that object S in this direction and there's another force F2 pulling in that direction, the combined result of those two forces is the resultant force which is created by drawing a parallelogram. So a parallel line to this force, a parallel line to this force and the resultant is the diagonal. The, so if I have a block or a cargo on an incline on the deck of a ship, gravity is down and that force is split in a force alongside the deck of the ship and a force perpendicular to the ship. And if this force is more than this friction force, then it will slide down. Yeah? And that's what you see here. If I have a, a piece of cargo on the deck and I change the inclination of the deck on a certain moment, it slides down. This downward force increases the friction force of the cargo. So what should you do? Put friction material, timber or rubber mats between the cargo and your load. And you see it will not slide down so easy, only a lot steeper and then it will finally slide down. So if we lift a box and we have a rope around the box, the G is put in the angle and must be lifted by the crane. And what are now the forces in the rope? It's these forces F1 and F2. If we change this top angle to a bigger top angle or the, the horizontal angle to a smaller angle, you'll see for the same G, you have a lot larger forces F1 and F2. So here the forces in the rope are more than the weight of the box. Uh, and if you go down more and more, that force will increase and increase. Yeah. So the dark blue are a lot bigger than the light blue. If we have a box, say like this briefcase, standing on the, on the floor of the train and the train moves in that direction, it's accelerating your briefcase. So in addition to the force of gravity, which is 10 times 9.81 if the box, box or the briefcase weighs 10 kilogram, there's an additional force opposite to the movement of the train and these two forces combined give you a resultant force and that resultant force, if it points over the tipping point of the briefcase, it will tip over. Yeah. So what do we do? 
we change the direction of the briefcase. Put it around and increase the base. So your resultant force is within the support points. Simple things to, to uh, follow. Or use lashings. Take a lashing to absorb, absorb that force. <coughs> Handling of heavy loads. Here are some examples. We have stability rules for ships. The International Maritime Organization, IMO, provides for that. We have stability rules for cranes. All load charts for cranes are based on 75% of tipping load. And there are no stability rules for trailers. And that's why still trailers fall over. What about stability of the load? That's a completely different matter. If I'm lifting a load, why, why is this not stable? And, and can it be unstable? Yes, it can. I'll show you that later on. It's not the intention to embarrass anyone or any company and it's showing you the following accidents. I'm trying to improve the safety in the heavy transport lifting and shipping industry. And what you see in these slides can happen to any of us. So let's stop these incidents, as they can all be prevented, provided we prepare, plan, and do some engineering. Transport stability. Three-point suspension system. What the hell is that? Usually, heavy transport is carried out on a so-called hydraulic platform trailer. The hydraulic platform trailer consists of a lot of tires. This is what we call one axle, that's an axle, and this is what we call an axle line. Usually a hydraulic platform trailer is 3 meter wide and the distance between the axle lines is 1 meter 50. And each hydraulic axle is suspended by a hydraulic cylinder so that over uneven road surfaces the hydraulic system equalizes the load. To do that they group the axles in a so-called three-point suspension system. So there's a hydraulic line around the trailer and there are connecting lines from all these hydraulic cylinders to this ring line and also in the ring line are valves and they can close and open the different valves to create a group of four hydraulic suspension cylinders as one point, a second point and a third point. And these so-called three-point suspension system uh, creates what we call a stable foundation. It's like a, leg, a table on three legs. It's always standing on three points. <coughs> as long as the center of gravity stays within these tipping lines, we are stable and it will not fall over. Steering is done by drawbar with steering rods connected to the axles and hydraulic cylinders which actually propel with hydraulic cylinders the opposite axles in a different way to create a kind of a circle pattern so that the trailer can steer itself around the corner. If you change the suspension system into a four-point suspension system you basically split this one point in two separate points and now you have a table on four legs. And we all know that a ta most of the tables, also chairs, have four legs. Because it creates the best stability rectangle. Yeah, if you compare that with that triangle you we had before, the beauty of a three-point suspension system is it's always standing on three legs. Even if the ground is unequal, the three legs will all be, be supported. If we have a table of four legs standing on an unequal ground, it's either standing on these two legs or on these two legs. So it's a little bit wobbling. That's the disadvantage of a three point of a four-point suspension system. But basically the distance from the center of gravity to the tipping line is bigger than a three-point suspension system. So what do we need to do? If we are negotiating in Canberra, in the movie I showed you earlier, level the trailer. Raise these two points and level the trailer so that your forces stay 
within the two tipping lines. And we don't want to reach this situation where all the force is only on these number of axles. You overload your trailer, plus the pressure in the system is so high you can't raise it anymore. There's no pressure here and there's only a little bit needed to make the whole unit tip over. So level it and make sure your forces is equal between the two axles. And how do we do that? Simple. Use a spirit level. A simple water level, put it on the back of the trailer and tell the trailer operator make sure under all circumstances keep it leveled. And if you see it changing, you say stop, you wait, you raise the trailer and you continue. It's simple. The four-point suspension system gives you the best ability, but it has the negative effect that it is wobbling if you're going over uneven terrain. So sometimes you see the pressure in the hydraulic system change a little bit. Uh, it might not be a, a, a problem, but that's, that's the uh, disadvantage. <coughs> now, this looks like a pretty high center of gravity, don't it? Yeah. And it's a very narrow trailer. It's an sp and a self-propelled modular transporter. The base between the two sets of axles is only 1 meter 45. And if you have a center of gravity high up in the air, which I presume here is about 5 meters high, you can imagine stability is not great, even on a four-point suspension system. What did they do? They transported it. See, this is the base. There are the hydraulic cylinders. And this is a high load. They didn't lash and secure the cargo. They were just rolling it off. And I'm pretty sure that they standard used the three-point suspension system, which even makes it worse. It's a nice equal load distribution, but it's a very unstable load. And that's what happens then. And it falls over. And it's not easy to recover this piece, which might be a heat exchanger of 200, 250 tons. Another example of a trailer that tipped. What went wrong here? I was mailed these pictures. And if you look at the pictures closely, the question is, what suspension system was used here? Can you check, can you see on the tires what you think, what kind of suspension system was used? Anyone has an idea? Was it three point or four point? Three, why? Because the forward block is all in the same direction and the two blocks after are in a different direction. Well, yes. See, these sets of trailer is one point, that set of six axle lines is another point, and you see here the six axles and that six axles are equalizing. There is a hydraulic connection between them, so that's one point. It's like a, like a water bed. If you push here, it comes up there. And that's what happened. It was pushed and this and that made the trailer tip. And if you look at it, they were negotiating a corner here with a lower end. They selected the wrong suspension system in the sense that they should have used these two points on the back and the single point in the front. The result then is that if you have a single point here, that dip here in the road will equal, be equalized by that single point and only the trailer will go a little bit down but not sideways and the, the guy in the back should notice it and say, hey, I'm coming with my one point in this dip, I must be alerted. The moment I go up, I can raise it. But no training, no experience, no idea. They just pulled in and that's the result. It fell over. Another example. A huge load, probably eight meters in diameter on a three meter wide trailer. Three point suspension system. They were lucky the saddles were so wide that when it tips, it hit the ground first and it didn't till, t topple over it completely. My rule of thumb is, when your load is twice as wide as the width of the trailer, so if you have a load of 6 meter and you want to put it on a 3 meter wide trailer, be careful, stability is becoming critical. A more precise guideline is, calculate the theoretical tipping line, tipping, sorry, tipping angle. And if that is between 8 and 15 degrees, you are in danger. Be careful and do not go below 
eight degrees. In my 40 years career, I was encountered in one accident incident uh, in the UK where a trailer tipped with a load of 203 ton on a 12 X-line trailer. And uh, they were negotiating a curve with a camber of only 2.8 degrees. Theoretically, the theoretical tipping angle was 14.4 degrees and it still tipped over. Because there are a lot more reasons why it could tip over. How accurate is the center of gravity in the center of the trailer? What are the effects of wind and uh, dynamic forces, uh, shock loads, uh, condition of the tires? And when it is leading, it's pushing the tires in at one side and it will lean more and more. So there are more reasons. So that's probably also why there are no stability rules yet for trailers, because it's a bit complicated. The ESTA has taken the initiative to establish some guidelines for SPMTs. Uh, and that's now uh, more or less a guideline, but it's not an easy document. And Mammut has in the meantime developed its own software whereby they uh, can, in a simple way, uh, give a tool to the uh, supervisors and transport people to, uh, to check the stability of their load. <coughs> How can it be done? As I said, most incidents can be prevented. Human error can be avoided by training, detailed engineering, use issue correct operating instructions. Inform your operators how they should carry out the job and what and how critical it is or not. And follow these procedures and instructions. Operational recommendations for transport. Monitor the level of the trailer by means of a spirit level, like you see on a ship, or with a simple, you have even now on your iPhone an inclinometer, which you can put your iPhone down and it will measure it in all planes, the angle. Yeah. A rule of thumb is, if the load is twice as wide as the trailer, watch out for stability. And more accurate, it should stick between 8 and 15 degrees. That's a rough rule of thumb. Preference is a three-point suspension system because it's an equal load distribution between all three points, but best stability for higher loads change it to a four-point suspension system. How can that be done? It's very simple. You just close one valve uh, to split that single point into two separate suspension points. Watch the pressure in each hydraulic suspension system and if one goes up too high, adjust it by lowering that point. Always avoid sudden movement, so braking, fast change of direction, fast acceleration, do it slow, gradually. That keeps the forces down. Stability criteria of cranes. If we have a crane like this simple drawing of a lettuce type boom crane, the load moment of the crane is the load it is lifting times the radius, and the radius is always measured to the center of the crane. So load times radius is what we call load moment, and it's expressed in ton meters. That's far more significant than the capacity of the crane. If I'm asking for a 100 tons crane, that 100 tons crane can lift 100 tons at only its minimum radius, 3 to 4 meter radius. So the load moment of that crane is 100 times 3, 300 ton meters. The tipping moment of a crane is the moment of the load plus the moment of the boom weight. Yeah, the boom also represents the weight. And if that is going over the tipping line, which is the plane through the front outrigger or with the crawler train of the, over the tracks, it will tip. And we stabilize this tipping moment by the counterweight of the crane and the rest of the crane body. And the manufacturers have calculated and designed the crane in such a way that all cranes are based on 75% of tipping. So it means the center of gravity of the crane plus the center of gravity of the load, the combined center of gravity moves and that should never be closer to this tipping plane than 75% of the tipping moment. It means if you divide one by 0.75, there's about 33% margin. Now some crane operators think they're clever 
and they switch off the LMB and said, I'll reach a little bit further because I need to cast that bucket of concrete in the corner of the building. And they switch off the LMB and they say, I can feel it on my pants when the crane becomes unstable. And what they are actually doing, they're balancing on this tipping point. And there's only a little bit needed, a shot load or a wind or whatever, and the whole thing will fill, fall over and it killed people. So don't do it. Your LMB load moment beveiliging, load moment indicator should always be on and in good proper working condition. With an unloaded crane, the angle between the vertical line through the, the, the back stage should at least be five degrees. So this is the rule to avoid cranes when they're not loaded of tipping over over the back because there's a lot of counterweight here and if you're standing on an incline and you are on an incline with more than five degrees your tr truck could tip over backwards like shown in this video he's unloading this crane from a truck and he built a ramp and while he's on the middle of that ramp he's turning his crane so that slope is apparently more than five degrees and he's turning an empty crane with a counterweight no wonder it, it will tip over. A thing which could simply be avoided had he known. Don't do that. How can we quickly estimate forces in slings? You have all these kind of rigging books and they throw factors to you, 1.4, 1 1 point whatever. I'll never look at those. I can't understand it. I never remember it. And I thought, how can we make life simple? If you make life simple, you will remember and you will apply it. And that's what I have done in my 45 years of being in the heavy lift transport industry. So I said, okay, if we are lifting a load with a load of 100 tons, with two slings, symmetrical, with an angle of 60 degrees, it means that angle is also 60 degrees, we can calculate the force in the green slings and it's 57.73 if you use the sign of that angle uh, and if you round it off I say okay that's 58 tons okay now I'm going to change the angle to 45 degrees how much is now the force in these green slings due to the increased angle the force is now 71 tons and if we keep changing this angle to a smaller angle to 30 degrees, you'll find with the same load, 100 tons, the forces in each sling are now each 100 ton. So lifting a load of 100 tons under 30 degrees, you need two slings of 100 tons. And if we remember these three numbers, and 100 tons, it means 58 of 100 tons equals 58%. And that's not too difficult to remember, 58% is close to 60. So if I'm lifting under 50, 60 degrees, I have 58% uh, of the load. So if I have 142 tons, I just take times 0.58 and I have the load in each sling. And here is 71% and here is 100%. Simple. So what is the, what is the load here? What is the load here? 71 tons. What is the load here? 58 tons. What's the load here? 100 tons. And if we want to find out the load here, well, this is angle of 45 degrees. This is root 2, 1, 1. So that is um, 50 tons. Stability. I was told to speed up. What is the time? Yeah. Uh, stability of the load. That's an important issue. No, not many people know about it. Have you heard about this, stability of the load? Anyone is familiar with stability of the load? No one? Okay. Well, if we are lifting a load with lift points at the top, like this box, it's a stable load. If we are lifting with lift points below the center of gravity, with short slings, like shown here, it's an unstable load. So what do we need to do to make this a stable lift? We have to lengthen the slings. 
and I'll show you if I'm lifting this. With long slings and, and close the center of gravity, it's a stable lift. Yeah? But if I if I change the length the length of the slings short like this, and I'm lifting, it's unstable. Yeah? So be careful when lifting a load, when lifting a load from lifting points below the center of gravity, it can be unstable. So to make it stable again, you have to lengthen the slings and enclose the center of gravity. Yeah? And that's illustrated here. If the distance from the center of gravity to this sling is large, we call it a large stability range. If that distance is small, it's a small stability range. And this container crane, mobile container crane, is being loaded on board of a Jumbo vessel. And they have a spreader frame, a spreader lift beam, connected to the outriggers. And in this case, the center of gravity is somewhere here in the middle, uh, shown here. It looks like it's shown in the triangle, so it should be stable load. Be careful when using a lift beam, you must shift this triangle to the lower points, so to this situation. It's still a stable load because it's in the top of the triangle, but it's still enclosed. If that is not enclosed, it will tip over. Yeah? And then that's the result. Yeah? And here you see this crane being lifted. This triangle, if you shift it to the lower points, the center of gravity is in the very tip of that, of that slings. And then the whole thing tips over and you have a major disaster. Lucky nobody was killed. This guy walked on deck before and was then laid on the key and he was okay. Yeah. So be careful and plan and prepare and do some engineering. So this is the case. I don't think I have time to demonstrate that, but what you do, should do is you, if you use a lift beam, you should shift this triangle to the points where we are lifting, which is here. And then if that center of gravity is not enclosed by this triangle, it will tilt. So we, we ex extend the slings, we make them longer, and now the triangle is enclosing the center of gravity. So in this direction it's a stable load. But here, in this, re this green spreader beams, we have also a triangle. And if this triangle is not enclosing the center of gravity, it will tip over in the other direction. And as I said, we don't have time to demonstrate that, but I have do that with these models to show you the effect and you'll feel it. It's hard to believe, but that's the fact. It will tip. Yeah. And here you see a crane being lifted from the bottom up. And they used, the same as here, continuous slings. So, so these slings could shift and it was already, it was still stable, but a little bit of shift made the sling turn and that's the end result. Again, a preventable incident. This is a dangerous type of lift beam for lifting from a lift point below the center of gravity. Uh, it is still stable because this triangle from the shift point of the block downwards is still enclosing the center of gravity. This is a better setup. Here you do not have to worry because you're lifting from lift points above the center of gravity, so it's always stable. But here, this, they use the same type of lift beam. This is the point, a small triangle downwards makes it tip. And they're lucky that the slings on that side stopped it from falling over. I'm sure they have no clue what they were doing. And they thought, hey, what's strange, it's hanging in the slings. They were lucky. Ship stability. I'll quickly run through this. GM value for the IMO, it should be at least 15 centimeters. Heavy lift ships usually have a GM value, which is a measure for stability of ships, between 1.4 and 2.5 meters. <coughs> and it can be adjusted by filling up water in the tanks. I'll show you how we can lift a heavy load by a heavy lift ship. This is an example of a Jumbo ship. Jumbo was the inventor 
of the stabilizer pontoon. We have the keel, the buoyancy point, the center of gravity of ship plus load, and the meta center around which the ship rotates. And if we lift this load, we, we first fill up the, the lower anti-healing tanks and the double bottom with ballast water. Then we attach the stabilizer, which increases the water line of the ship, so the M is increased. Then we bring out the boom, we counter with weight with, with ballast, lift the load and at the same time ballast water is pumped in here to balance the load we are lifting. Then we slowly lift the load. The total G, load plus ship, is increasing but my GM still is positive and we must have a positive GM otherwise the ship becomes unstable. And the moment we lower it down on the tank top, the moment it's down, the G goes down yeah, and then we take the stabilizer off, M goes down and my GM is still positive. That's the basics of loading or unloading a heavy load. We all know this, uh, in 2015 in August this 187 tons bridge section was lifted by two mobile cranes standing on, a, uh, on two small barges in Alfa van der Rijn and what they ignored here completely was stability of the barges. They have done a calculation and thought it was still a positive GM but the stability margin was too small besides the fact that hydraulic cranes are built to stand on firm solid ground and stay horizontal and uh, that was not the case here. Uh, stability was minimal. Uh, it made the unit uh, tilt back and the sudden moment the angle of the boom with the vertical was so much that the side force on the boom was exceeding the allowable forces and made the boom buckle. You see in a moment that the crane suddenly buckles. This boom, here we go, the, the, the boom buckled and then that leap hair, 400 tons leap hair fell over and the outrigger of this crane was on the edge, not secured at all and it tipped over the edge and also that crane fell over with a result of 18 houses being de destroyed and one dog killed. That was all. Stability is calculated and I did my analysis on this case and I said it was a positive GM so I, in the, at first I didn't know what really happened in Alfa van der Rijn uh, but later on the investigation showed that what a major role played was first of all the uh, uh, deflection of the hydraulic booms which decreased the stability even further and it became negative and that's why the whole thing toppled over. Saddles are uh, fixed uh, with clips. I'll sh show you here examples and I don't like clips at all. First of all they are applied here the wrong way. They should be turned around. This should be on the dead end of the wire and the saddle should be on that. So never settle a dead horse. Yeah, clips tend to, to slip and who is going to check if, if all these clips are tightened correctly. Here are some examples of incidents. This crane was lifting a signboard and they were untightening the bolts but the crane operator was too eager to lift it. He didn't uh, have good communication with the people and he thought he was trying to lift it but it was still connected to the pole. So he was just overloading his crane badly and then the whole thing tipped. Lifting an airplane in India where uh, either they bumped into the boom or actually were uh, overstressing the boom with the result that the boom buckled. Uh, so again, follow the safety rules and the manual of the crane. You can quickly calculate how much crane is needed, but if they don't do that, here another example of a, a small boom trying to lift a, a pipe section of a stack, uh, overstressing the crane, buckling of boom and also tipping of the whole crane. Another lift being lifted. Here's some transport incidents when you roll on or roll off onto a barge, make sure your barge is properly moored and your mooring lines are tight. 
and if they're not, you would just push the bars away from the key, and you land up in the river. He was lucky he jumped out in time, but his truck is lost, as you can see. Gone. Lashing and securing of pipes on deck of a vessel in bad weather. Uh, there were no stanchions or supports or wedges. There were just some wires around it. And if you just pull wires around it, that has very little effect. So the moment one pipe goes, the rest goes. There's one, the second, third, etc. There's your deck cargo, gone. Tell your client. We did a lousy job. A crawler crane lifting a bad, a, a big steel section of a flyover or a, or a train pass over, I don't know, but hard, hev heavily overloaded the crane with super lift and the whole thing just tips over. Apparently uh, stopped or tried to lift it. Do not try. These result in terrible incidents. Lifting a 200 tons crane with soft slings where the rigging failed. Uh, be careful, soft slings are very nice and light and you can easily handle them. This is 15 ton safe working load, it has 105 tons brake load. This is Dinema. Uh, it's, a, it's a round sling made by Liftex. Very light and strong. Dinema is really nice. Uh, equipment but it's a bit more expensive but it's light so it can ha you can handle it a lot easier and quicker this boom is ha highly overstressed and finally you will see what happens it just breaks off <coughs> pats gone and here again rigging failed and we can continue showing you all these answers. In case you uh, want to see the full lessons and experiences I'd like to transfer to you, join us on the 1st, 2nd and 3rd of October in uh, Rotterdam, in Schiedam. Thank you for your attention. Any uh, burning questions? <laughs>